Is anyone else on the um, yes, webinar? Yes, <laughs> this is Steve. Can you hear me? Yeah, I just wanted to check and make sure. <laughs> okay, well, we're all here. <laughs> As I said yesterday, Norma, hail, hail the gang's all here. <laughs> what the heck do we? Yeah. And that's H A I L, about just for the record, for a good Baptist like you. So. Oh, yeah, I, I knew what you were saying. <laughs> All right, so so I've got to start getting in here and uh, making sure everything's ready to go. I've got to put this puppy dog in presentation mode. All right. All right. All right. You you can't see that yet. No, I can't. But uh, but Charles will uh, will allow us to do that. So. Uh, is uh so our uh, you know you know our dear friend uh kathy muse has said and might say in this situation i imagine that uh david and harold are making sure that they are properly toileted so uh you ever you ever heard kathy say that you know she you know kathy, yeah. uh, kathy will say anything you know that right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, David reminded me of the same thing. <laughs> he said, sure you go to the restroom before you sit down. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. I, I just made what the Israeli military used to call a preemptive strike, you know. So, uh, so, uh, so anyway, it's, uh, so. Hi, uh, hi Norma and, uh, and uh, Stephen. So I just made you guys co-host. You should be able to uh, share the slides now. Let me know if you have any issues. So what I do, just hit Alt-S and it'll, it'll go to it. Um, so on the uh, Zoom window, you should see a thing that says share screen. So you want to have your slides up. Once your slides are up, then you're going to so click uh, share screen. screen and Zoom, and then you'll right. click on the slide. Right. So I need to go to end show and go to my uh, Zoom screen, which is right there, and pull down. That one's not working. Let's see if the other one will work. David, hey, Charles, David taught me a shortcut yesterday. Okay. And let's see here. Uh, this is just a little thing. He said hit Alt S. That's right. Yeah, maybe that does work. I didn't know that. Can you see it now? No. Um, no. You cannot. Uh, was, it, was it Control S? No, it was or Alt S. It was Alt. All right, let me see here. All right, now remind me again where I go up here to share. I see it up in the in the top right corner of my PowerPoint slides. So it's not going to be on your slides. You're going to click share. Um, once you have your slides open, you have to open up the uh, Zoom window, and then once Zoom is up, you should see a big white screen that says share screen right in the middle, and you click in Zoom share screen, and then it's going to ask you what do you want to share, and you're going to tell it your slides. Okay. So I, I see, I see a green thing up here. It says that I'm a Zoom meeting, and it says settings. Switch to view. We don't want that. And what, Steve, do you have up on your on your computer where it shows the meeting talk back, the host, password, invite link, all that stuff, your participant ID? Yeah, I do. That's where I am. Okay, share screen. Click on it. Where does it say share screen? Down in the middle, on the very bottom of that, where it has the meeting topic, host, password, invite link, participant ID, and it says join audio, share screen, invite others. So you want to click on the share screen. Okay, let me go back to that. I'm looking at all the things that I have here. All right. I've got the meeting ID and it says my personal meeting ID PMI. Is that the one you're talking about? No, when you clicked into Zoom to get on Zoom. On my email brings... address? On my email address? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm here also. Hey, hey David. David. Hey David, good. All right, let me just go back to here then. All right, and I've got, uh, all right, so I clicked into share Zoom. You said click. So share screen. 
So yeah, I'm looking at the email message right now. So I'm starting. Oh, oh okay. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. So, so what I do now is I click here to join, right? Again. So Correct. I'm, here, I'm, Correct. Over here, I'm over here twice. Okay. And I've got all my information there. It's asking me my webinar registration. And it says join webinar in progress. I am not a robot. Oh, shoot, I'm getting taken to this whole darn thing. The statues. Okay. Get oh, worst case scenario, I can share the slides on my side, <laughs> and I just have to, you have to let me know when to progress. And if you can't quite figure it out, it's no big deal. I, I, I know that, but I mean, uh, you know, David told me the show yesterday I, that I could hit all. Just hit Control S. Control S. Okay. Yeah. Can you see it? Nope. Let me let me let me get rid of this. Y'all still hear me or not? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It was it was Alt S, not Control S. Try that. Yep, the Alt S. That brings up a window, and then you'll click on the slide that you want to share. That way. It brings up a window light with a little NIGP screen on it, and. Um, We know at the, at the least, Charles, we don't need to panic because you can show your slides, right? So yeah, can't, um, it's better if you guys can do it because you know when to progress the slides. But yeah, worst case scenario, I'll just do it on my side. Okay. Charles, uh, Charles, is there, it's, it's not connected at all to the fact that you've disabled video, is it? No, that nothing to do with it. Yeah. All right, thank you. See, I'm, okay, let me get here. Okay. Let me get this here. Okay, we're here. All right. There we go, something's happening. There we go. Nice. I just had to be, I had to, I had to be slow and deliberate. <laughs> it works. All right, I'm trying to, there we go, there we go. That's got it. Looks good. Yep. All right. And uh, I guess we're waiting for how. Charles, would, it, would there be a way uh, at certain intervals you could tell us where we are? And it might only be necessary if you tell us when we have 30 minutes left. Yeah, whatever you want me to do. Um, you want to let me, I can give you 15 minute increments, 30 minutes left. Um, what do you guys think? Would 30 minutes left be enough? Yeah, it's fine. 15, what was your plan? Were you planning on going all the way up to the uh, um, for a full hour and thirty minutes and thirty minutes questions at the end? Was it the full two hours? What, what was your timeline? What were you thinking? What? Wait a minute. We're 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 only allowed an hour and a half, right? Yeah, that's kind of the maximum because we only leave time for questions at the end. But um, no. some webinars go an hour. Um, it, it. Yeah, I mean, if you were to go an hour and. Uh, 40 minutes, something like that. It's up the end of the day. I mean, that's fine. Yeah, we just, we try and target an hour and 30. No, no, we're thinking and maybe we're hoping, smile, smile, that we're going to have more questions than we can answer. So, uh, and we've even set up a, a dedicated uh, email address slash box where we can, uh, people can send their follow-up questions. So, uh, that's good. Yeah. So we've, uh, we've done that. And, um, uh, now the um, 
So what's going to happen here on the uh, on this first slide, Charles? You know, this this title slide that you see there. Now, that's when you'll be talking, right? Yeah. So what I'll do is I will introduce um, uh, the webinar, and then uh, I think one of the last lines is uh, let's see here in my. I, and then I will um, tell uh, Dr. Gordon to, to take it away at, once I'm done. Okay, and then we'll then I'll flip to the next slide. We're good. And uh, but I think we're um, I think we're good. And the polling question, just a detail of that. You know, we went ahead and put on the slide the full polling question. So you will actually do a another dialogue box, for lack of a better word, that will actually have the poll in it, right? Yes, so what you'll see it um, whenever you say you want that poll, I have a list. I only have two. I've got one for slide four and slide eighteen. Right. Um, so you, so you'll just drop you'll just drop down that survey on top of this slide, right? So yeah, you don't have to do anything. It's going to show up as like a uh, an option for participants to click on, and then um, they'll answer it, and then I will uh, show the results so that um, everyone can see it, including you guys, and then you can talk about those results, and then when you're done. I'll remove the poll and get ready for the next one that you have. Sounds, sounds good. By the way, Steve, on the polling questions, the, the second polling question I'm looking for it now is basically how much are you willing to commit or something like that? Um, I'm headed back there right now. All right, I appreciate it. I, uh, as I looked at it this morning, it looked fine all the way up until this morning to me. And then I'm wondering, well, we're going to have, let's just, talk through the result. Let's say 40% of the people. Here it is, it's on slide 20. Uh, how much of a contribution are you personally able and willing to make in your current role to mitigate supply shortages in future widespread emergencies? Uh, I guess my question is, you know, what the results will be the results. And the question is, what do we, how do we talk to that? Uh, you have Charles and I are listed and I don't think Charles is going to want to <laughs> take this one. So I'm just thinking, you know, I think we're all going to have to talk through this because I really don't know. What okay. To say. I mean, I assume everyone. Okay. Well, okay. Oh, right. I, I hear you. A few things occur to me. Okay. Um, one is the assumption, you know, Norman and I have taught a seminar in the past with a person named Martha. What was Martha's last name? I can't remember. Johnson, right. I believe. What at Johnson? Martha Johnson, right. On leading from wherever you are in the organization. Okay. So you can just say as a context is we are asking you this question, regardless of where you're sitting in your organization. Uh, do you how much what is your will and ability to um, to drive this goal? That's what you're really doing. Because, you know, as we often know, David, you know, in any organization, you know, they're the so-called formal leaders. Yeah. They are the, uh, the real leaders. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's what we're asking then. Right. No, I get, and, and, and my question is, how do we talk to the response? That, that's the question. I, I think the question is a great one. I mm -hmm. mean, again, again, I assume everyone's going to be medium or major. I doubt that anyone one at this time is going to say at yeah, none or very little. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I can talk to it extemporaneously. I really don't need further. I just didn't know if you had an anticipated talking points you wanted to touch upon given the results. No, uh, well, I think just, you know, it may sound trite, but you know, it's, um, you know, that, um, you know, that the, the, the ability and the, the will are, are key. You know, we probably, we could have broken this out into two questions. But to me, the most important thing is the will, and you know we could have got we could have further broken it out. Um, you could just sort of you know talk through this is, you know they may not be able to because of where they sit in the organization, for example. Okay. I'll, I I I can um, I'll talk to it when yeah, um, and the results will not be a surprise. It would only be a surprise if they group down toward A and B, but I think they're going to group up toward C and D. Yeah, right. And it's just really a thought question is all it is. It doesn't have to be, it's definitely not a perfect question, but it's, uh, it's, it's just a th something to get them, uh, to get them going and, um, and to get them, because a major part of what we're trying to do here 
is not only give people ideas, but, uh, you know, motivate them to do things, uh, you know, differently than they've done in the past. So, you know, I think whatever you say will be fine. It's what I'm trying to say in a very long and articulate way. <laughs> so. All right. Well, thank you for your confidence in my <laughs> ability to have the gift of gab, I guess. Well, well, you are an <laughs> Irishman, you know, excuse me. For that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I've got that curly hair to prove it right now. You're right, right. So, so, uh, so, uh, but I, um, I'm just looking through here, and um, and normally, you know, on that last on that last question, you know, you can just I will say this up front, but you can remind them like we're going to get to as many questions as we can here. But if you don't, when you turn to the next, slide, you can just say uh, here's your email address to which you can send any questions that we didn't get to, or any follow ups or anything else like that. So, yeah, I, that that's good. This is um, I'm really looking forward to this, Steve. Thank you once again. And Charles and the whole NIGP staff for, you know, Justin, everyone that's gotten us to this point. This will, yes. um, this will go pretty quickly, I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's, you know, as you and I both know, it's, uh, I don't know if you ever asked, we're in a classroom in like an English, English composition, and someone would always ask the, uh, in, the teacher, the professor, how long does the paper need to be? And then she would always say what, or he as long as it needs to be. So uh, I'm not, we're not measuring, we're, de we're, at least my personal assessment is coming yeah. from, out, from an outcome standpoint rather than from a uh, how long it lasts standpoint, so. Yeah. I think, last, I think it's gonna last longer than you think. Steve, are you on a uh, dynamic mic? Are you on a headset? No, I'm, I, I'll just, do I need to move in a little closer here? I don't know. I'm getting a little bit of, it's a hollow. I wouldn't call it an echo or anything. It, and, and it's not, it's not bad. It, you can be understood clearly. I, it just sounded a little. Uh, let me, let me try my headphones and see if that sounds any different. Okay. All see, right. I don't need, won't see me looking like a Martian here. So. Let's hope this doesn't mess up the audio. Can you uh, can you hear me better now? I like that better. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that sounds that sounds better. Hey, Hal. Hey, how you doing? All right. So uh, I didn't know you had jumped in there. So we'll go we'll go with that. I just came on. Good. Good. Well, how's the moving coming along? I'm pa we're unpacking, I should say. We're, surra we're surrounded by boxes, but <laughs> yeah. I'm glad it's not video, or at least it doesn't have a whole room view. I don't know. People might find that interesting, actually, to look at that. You know, <laughs> interesting, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not always interesting to all parties. Well, I don't know. I don't know. It might, uh, might, might very well be. I know what I'm doing right here, right now, is uh, I am just remembering to turn the volume on my, um, or perhaps I just should turn this. Uh, my iPhone off altogether. What do you guys think about that? Unless we need to communicate with one another, I'm gonna just turn the volume down so we can text one another. Hey Charles, I see we're we're getting we have a, a chat um, entry. I assume this will only be seen by panelists. Is that right? Oh no, I, I take that back. He says all panelists and attendees. You can uh, in the drop. There's a little drop box where you can make something, uh, a message sent to a particular person, to all panelists, and or to everybody. All right. Yeah. So yeah. we'll yeah. see this throughout the right. presentation. Yes, yeah, so you have to click on the little drop box next to the word two. Right now, now we were not knowing the answer to that question. We were just operating on the assumption that you were going to filter the question somehow. Can you still do that so that we won't have to think too much, even though it's going up in public? Or do we just do we need to uh, answer on a first in basis? Yes. So part of the introduction is going to be instructing uh, participants to they can submit questions at any time, but we're going to um, answer those questions at designated time. Typically, uh, the webinars will. That's why we save that last thirty minutes um, mm -hmm. for that time, unless you want to answer questions earlier. But typically, it's always done at the very end. No, 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 no. We we actually have you know we we plugged in. 
actually three one question marks, one of which is as, at the end when we're planning to answer the questions. So, um, so well now will you ask those questions? Will you go through those questions or should I do that or, or what? Yeah, I can do that. I'll pull up the uh, Q&A box and I will, uh, and I will uh, say what the question is and then go mm -hmm. from there. All right. And, and, um, and guys, just as we will on all slides, we should all feel free to chime in on the questions, right? What do you think? Not that, not that it's mandatory, but feel free to. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I think we talked about on the slides, we would, um, we would, um, um, we would, once we finished our, our discussion of the slide, we would, um, um, you know, ask, ask other people, you know, you know, ask, ask the other, of the four of us, you know, what do you have to say? So. Right, yeah. Y'all, we have 71 participants on the line right now. Listening to us in, in living color, uh -huh. right? That's yes. good. That's great. We have people from Frisco, Hagerstown, Maryland, College Park, Maryland, Mountain City, Tennessee, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, Sarasota, Florida, Charleston, West Virginia. Oh, let's see who else we have here. Uh, and Hernando, Florida. Yeah. And, and Beth Dooley is online. Hey, everybody. Hello. I guess they can't talk to us, so no, right. they, they can only hear us. But but I did want to acknowledge them. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely, we appreciate it. Norm, are you getting? Uh, are you feeling any of the effects of the bad weather coming in from the uh, hurricane? It's raining here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, is the, uh, is the eye going to pass over you, or do you know? I don't think so. I'm so inland. Good. Might, might do something with the coast. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. Is, is Beth getting ahead of us, David? So. Evidently. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. Hmm. Well, I have what? Since I got my screen dominating, we have five minutes in counting, right? Counting down. More people are joining.
All right, so I'll go ahead and get us started here. Pull over. All right, so hello and welcome to the NIGP uh, webinar, Mitigating Supply Failures During Future Widespread Emergencies, an interactive discussion involving the attendees and facilitators. Uh, presented, uh, presented by Dr. Stephen Gordon, David Gragan, Norma Hall, and Hal Good. If at any time during the webinar you need technical assistance, please let us know in the Q&A box. Uh, during the presentation, you may submit questions to the Q&A box on your screen, and we will take them during specified parts of the presentation. All right, Dr. Gordon, uh, would you like to get us started? Charles, absolutely. Be happy to, because everybody's time is valuable. And uh, thank you, Charles, and thank all of you, uh, each, or I should say each of you, who are in the uh, audience uh, joining us today. And we, we really appreciate your uh, sharing an hour of, and a half of your time, if it takes that long because we know how, uh, how busy you are. Our intent today is to uh, share with you some of our thoughts and ideas uh, for how we might uh, avoid the awful situation that we all found ourselves in in the procurement community uh, at, the, at the beginning of this, uh, and even, even now in many places of this uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. What we're going to be talking about today is um, at a both a macro, if you think back to your economics classes you took, at both a macro level and a uh, and a micro level. And uh, so, what I'm going to do now is uh, introduce uh, introduce briefly myself, and then also introduce uh, my colleagues who are working with us. Uh, First of all, I can tell you, I have, uh, I have personally been in public procurement since dinosaurs roamed the earth. And, uh, and, uh, and all kidding aside, I, uh, I have a real, real strong passion for uh, advancing the uh, practice of public procurement, not for the sake of public procurement alone, but because of the tremendous good uh, that, uh, that public procurement, if done correctly, can do can do for society. And, uh, and I'm joined today by our, my uh, colleagues, um, Norma Hall and David Gregan and, and uh, Harold or Hal Good. I've, long, I've known Hal long enough to call him Harold, so uh, you may hear me call him both. So Norma, would you say a word or two about yourself? <clears throat> Excuse me, yes. I have been in procurement for, and actually state procurement for over 44 years. So I've got a lot of experience from different types of agencies in emergencies that they have had to handle in the past and some ideas that we came up with um, along, along those emergencies. And it's uh, sometimes a challenge to work your way through it, but instead of a challenge, I always um, thought of those as opportunities and what was the opportunity bringing me. But um, with that, I ha have also been the past president of NIGP and um, have been greatly involved in the procurement profession uh, even after I retired in August of 18. So with that, I'm going to pass it on over to David. Hi there. Thanks, Nora. Um, I'm Dave Gregan and I am in procurement in a procurement office in Washington, D.C. now. My, my former agency, I was the procurement director here of the, of the city of D.C. for a number of years. And uh, prior to that was a state procurement director in both Indiana and Texas. Um, and, I, and then I went to the federal government for about eight years as a procurement executive at uh, a new federal agency called the CFPB about 10 years ago. Uh, recently, though, I had the opportunity to come back to my old office um, in a chief learning officer role, which I'm enjoying immensely, and it's an opportunity, just like this is this afternoon for the next hour or so, for us to share the things we've had the privilege of learning over the years. Um, so, and I, But I didn't start out to be a procurement person. I think so many of us did not. Probably none of us did, but here we are. I, I actually grew up wanting to be a Marine wanting to be a fighter pilot and a Marine, which I, I went ahead to the Marine Corps um, as an officer in the Intel business and did that for the first portion of my professional career. And then by wonderful happenstance, fell into this uh, tremendous profession 
in Indiana. And um, I'll, I'll share with you because I think it's relevant and we'll talk about this a little bit later on. My very first experience coming out of the Marine Corps and then suddenly ending up in procurement in the state of Indiana government, um, but having an interest in the way we did, you know, the, the way we manage emergencies and contingencies and high tempo operations, all of these things that are relevant now. My first experience when I realized we had a, a, an emergency operations center conducting an exercise in, in the building right next to mine in Indianapolis, and it was a bunch of state employees, you know, doing what state employees do when we practice for emergencies and, you know, whether they're weather emergencies or whatever it might be. Um, so I walked over to the emergency operations center and I walked in knowing that I was going to see just like I would see on board a, a, a ship or in the Marine Corps, I, I was going to see an operations center with a bunch of, uh, you know, desks set up to reflect transportation, communications, um, all of the different segments of, of how we manage government operations. And sure enough, there was a procurement desk. I walked in and thought, well, good, this will be one of my people. One of my 55 people from the state procurement office will be sitting right behind that sign. Um, so I went over to that desk and found a state policeman sitting behind that sign, someone I'd never met, but he looked really good in uniform. And he had a gun and he had a telephone <laughs> and he had a telephone book. And that's how procurement was done in 1993 when it came to emergencies. And so the reason I say that now at the beginning of our presentation is at the end, I want us to all reflect upon the fact that we, if never before have we had the chance, and many of us have, but if never before have we in our profession, procurement professionals, had the chance to really be operators, to be the gunslingers, to be the people that are, are, are leading from the front of the battle space, this is the time. Um, and I know we're all doing extraordinary things under extraordinary circumstances. I just don't want us to lose in the next, you know, 60 or 70 minutes, the, the idea that this is a tremendous opportunity, notwithstanding all of the strain and duress that we're all under. Um, that, that's kind of what a lot of this is about from my perspective. If we're looking for a silver lining to me, that's possibly one of them for us. Um, all right, so sorry for the long introduction and I will turn it over to Hal Good. Hi, everybody. Happy to join you today. Like uh, was mentioned before, I doubt that very many of us started out in procurement, and I was one of those. I started out at NYU Langone in the middle of Manhattan in the clinical area, and I was a respiratory therapist and was the assistant director of respiratory care. And I moved over into procurement and supply chain and materials management because of the difficulty we had, even though we had an outstanding procurement department, the people in procurement procurement through no fault of their own didn't understand the medical language and actual uses of things. So that's when I crossed over to procurement. And since then, uh, a lot of you might know me from the 21 years I spent as director of procurement and contracting for the city of Palm Springs, which included the Palm Springs International Airport and the convention center. And then I was fortunate enough to uh, work for a county near uh, uh, Washington, D.C., where I had an opportunity to get involved in a lot of federal related things, also federal things through airport purchasing, which is largely financed by federal. So I have kind of a combination of uh, private sector, public sector, and healthcare. And most recently, some of you might know me from social media, because what I've tried to do in social media is kind of combine those things and be a connector in terms of the overall causes for procurement and supply chain issues by connecting uh, the various disciplines on uh, social media and facilitate that. Turn it back to Steve. Well, Hal, thank you very much. Uh, you didn't mention that your boss in, uh, in uh, Palm Springs, for those, and I'm saying this for those of, of, our, of our attendees who are old enough to remember, but you actually worked for the late Sonny Bono. So, uh, so that was one of your claims to fame there, right? So. Uh, that, that's correct. And Sonny taught me a lesson that I'll never forget. And that is, you didn't have to do any something well in order to be successful at it. Uh, those of us that know the inside know that Sonny wasn't a very good singer, but he had all those gold records in the wall. And that's just one of the things that Sonny uh, was bold yeah. enough to do and was very successful, even though there's probably other people that did it better. Well, good. Well, thank, thank you all for your introduction. And uh, as you can see for the attendees, as you can see at the top of the slides, uh, we have known one another as a group forever. 
So uh, don't be surprised if occasionally we talk over one another, interrupt one another. We're all friends and we'll get over it. So, uh, and we're looking forward as well to, uh, to your questions. Let me uh, walk you now through a, uh, we have a polling question, which I believe Charles is going to release to you now, so. Um, yeah, let me pull it up here for everybody. Polling question, try the right one. I think polling question is up. Looks like we're getting in uh, a lot of votes, moving out. Mm. Take about 10 more seconds and then we'll call it. Okay. Are you calling it now? Is that what you're doing? Okay. Uh, yep, we're going to call it now in poll, and then we're going to share the results. Okay. Well, I'll I'll chime in here, guys, and, and the other three of you just pitching as well. It's interesting to me to see that, uh, and that, none of these are really surprising, but uh, just the frustration that uh, you all and we all uh, would feel at not being able to uh, at having uh, you know contractors and suppliers uh, not fulfilling their requirements. That's definitely a uh, frustration and uh, and I'm interested to see that uh, that the first choice finished number three I guess I'm a little surprised with that but uh, but number two is no surprise uh, Norma David how what do you guys see there well first I had to unmute myself so sorry about that <clears throat> I think that um, having to do business with unknown and or untrustworthy suppliers has been a big deal for a lot of people. I know that there have been multiple procurement organizations that have given out uh, information and links to uh, other organizations that can help identify those suppliers that are um, legitimate suppliers. I know that in LinkedIn, I got an awful lot of contacts that you know wanted me to um, acknowledge them or to have them as a contact, and they were uh, 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 most often they were with COVID nineteen supplier for PPE, and to me that was a little disconcerting because you don't know where they're from, their background information, nothing on them. So, to me, I think the second one really is a big one. And I think that um, Hal has um, actually worked with people in identifying individuals that are trustworthy uh, suppliers that are committed to getting you the supplies that you need. And Hal, you were, um, when we were discussing this, you were talking about ways that people could check on those suppliers. So do you want to respond a little bit to that? Yeah, I think I think the combination of two and three reflects the fact that we're we were confronted as procurement professionals in something that we never experienced before. And that is that always before things were regional. So that if you couldn't find something somewhere, there was somewhere else that you could get it and from a supplier that at least you could get some good references and so forth on. And this was unique in the fact that we were looking for things that you couldn't seem to find anywhere. And then a lot of the people that came forward claiming to be able to supply were actually brokers and didn't have it. And they tried to take your order or look for payment up front. And so that led to a lot of frustration, a lot of unfulfilled uh, promises and so forth. So I think, it was, I think what we're looking at in two and three and, and the number of people that chose that is probably partly a reflection of that in that it's a unique experience because even when we had natural occurrences like uh, uh, hurricanes or, or earthquakes or, or um, volcanoes, you know, that affected our supply lines, at least globally, there's always somewhere that you could get it. 
It was just a matter of finding it. And the frustration with this is we were looking for things that were life-saving, critical things, and it seemed like we couldn't find them anywhere in the world. Yeah, and I, I want to comment on a couple of chat responses, which I think are absolutely on the mark and, and very interesting and worthy of note. Um, it looks like Nicole mentions not being involved, one of the frustrations, and one which we didn't mention in the poll directly, was not being involved early in the communications. I think this is a kind of a longstanding, recurring um, frustration that we probably have all had, both in, both in crisis and even, you know, in the more normal mode when we're not in crisis. Yeah, not being involved early. It, it makes it much more difficult to do our jobs. And when the, you know, when the chips are really down and when everything is urgent, it becomes even more profoundly frustrating. So I definitely agree with that comment uh, made by Nicole. And then Cheryl brings up a really, a really good point that we've probably all seen um, may, way more now than we probably would see under normal circumstances. And that's suppliers contacting elected officials, you know, board members, commission members, city council members in Washington, DC, state legislators, um, probably in state governments. That, that, that's what everyone knows that's a way to get to the into the executive branch to go through the legislative branches a good way to at least get the attention of the executive branch that's a that is a common issue and problem it has really become pervasive i think in the last just my observation here in in dc over the last 10 or 12 weeks is that yeah a phone call to an elected official a city council member in the dc government ends up being a phone call to the procurement director ends up being uh, us having to sort of vet somebody who's unvettable, as it turns out. Many of these suppliers that say, yeah, I can do that, they, they have nothing more than their own hope that they could do something. Um, but yet we still have to track that down and chase that down. And I doubt that there's very many people on this call or on this webinar that haven't been frustrated by how much time it takes to chase down these false leads. But they, come, they enter the system that way. It's, um, yeah, it's greatly frustrating. I would agree with that, Cheryl. Okay. Well, guys, in my excitement, I, I ran right past the previous slide. So let me, let's back up now and, uh, and, uh, and look at uh, sort of how we're going to run this thing. Uh, I say run it. That's not the right, that's too strong of a word. Uh, you've been asked the first of the two polling questions. And uh, when we get into the um, slides uh, it themselves, and there aren't, I, I uh, can tell you there are not that many slides, so don't think we're going to kill you with uh, PowerPoint. Uh, each of us has been assigned uh, certain slides that we're, that we're going to walk through. And just as we did on the polling question, after uh, whoever's assigned the slide makes their, their walk through, uh, the rest of us will jump in and add some comments too. Now at intervals uh, marked by question mark slides, um, we will respond to your questions and comments. And uh, we will uh, respond to two or three questions at each interval, depending on how much time we have. And only written questions uh, will be accepted. Um, but please, uh, you, you can, may submit your questions and comments at any time. And uh, any questions or comments that you make that we cannot respond to at the, uh, we'll respond to at the end of the slide presentation, time permitting. And we've also added a, uh, an email address to which you can send any questions that we still don't get to. So let's, uh, let's keep drilling here, get past the. Uh... Okay, Norma. I'll now turn it over to Norma. I'm just talking away with mute on, I apologize. Um, this slide is gonna address how COVID-19, the pandemic has um, had awful consequences. And the very first consequence that I want to bring to light or you know, to talk about with people is the human consequences that have happened. There have been so many, um, illnesses and deaths, uh, healthcare workers have gotten sick, 
um, as you know, that has impacted a, a lot of people. And then as those people have gotten sick and some of them have ha unfortunately passed away um, in the hospital by themselves with no family around, no funerals have been able to be held unless it was for X number of people or less. So uh, in most cases, there haven't even been any loss of, um, of you know, so that brings grief and then isolation where, you know, many people are isolating by themselves, just one individual. So social isolation has been a big thing. Loss of income, loss of jobs, loss of, uh, bus uh, you know, a, a business that has been in, in place for a very long time. I have seen multiple businesses that have chains all over the country that are closing down because of what has happened within the pandemic. But then let's get to the other side of things, and that's for state and local governments um, and how things have changed for them. And one of the biggest things that I notice, and not just in this pandemic, but in any emergency, is that local governments need to transform their procurement laws so that it can help you face the potential um, conflicts that you're having in getting those supplies uh, in a timely manner and at a price that is reasonable. And I think that's the big thing is you might be able to supply, get the supplies, but there's no guarantee of the time that they're going to get to you and there's no guarantee of price and they want you to pay for it in advance of getting the shipment, you pay for it and then you don't know when it's coming or if it's gonna be the quality that you need. So state and lo local governments need to really look at transforming their procurement laws. Um, and, you know, this is the new normal. This is going to be the new normal for individuals. And how can we as procurement professionals look to the future and try and put in place contracts and laws and different aspects that are going to get us through these types of events in the future? So um, I think that we need to look at the technology that we're using. We need to make sure that we have enough cap human capital um, to be able to do the job and, and just other resources that we need. I know that a lot of people worked from home in their organizations and were um, connected um, virtually from home and, and conduct a business. And so that was a real change in, in the environment as well. You were no longer in with a group of people that you could discuss things with. You were singul a singular person in your agency working from home, trying to come up with these ideas and uh, how you were gonna resolve or solve these issues uh, you know, by yourself. So with that, there's a, there was a lot of change that we had to, or consequences that we had to face or we are facing because of this. And my question is, how do we take care of that today for future? And what do we look at? What, do we, what questions do we ask? And how do we carry on business as normal in a, in a time of an emergency? So that's just a thought that I want to leave you with so that um, if anybody has any questions, certainly put those in the, in the questions in the chat and um, we'll go on from here. And I think the next slide is David. Well, thanks, Norma. Um, some questions are coming in. I'm not going to address those right now, but I just want uh, the folks that are writing questions in the question box to know that we are seeing these. If we, We're going to have a little pause here in a moment to to address some of the questions, and we'll do that a couple times throughout the, the webinar, as Steve mentioned early on. Um, on this slide, I, I'm gonna draw your attention first to the quotation on the right-hand side. Nothing really surprising there. It is a very complex issue. Not only the PPE shortage, but, but now that we're going into the contact tracing phase and we're, many of us are putting in place contracts for that service, um, the, the, the whole, particularly PPE though, because it deals with supply chain is a very complex issue. It requires tremendous coordination. Um, this person says unprecedented coordination. Supply chain issues all, always require extraordinary coordination. Um, and one of the things that makes this unusual for us as procurement professionals in government is we typically do not, do not sp spend a lot of time managing second and third and fourth tier suppliers within the supply chain. We, we rest upon the privity of contract that we have with our primes. 
and we anticipate that they will manage everything beneath them. But just as we have had little control, if, if any control, zero control probably, over you know, the, the, the prime's access to supply chains, likewise, all of those tiers within the supply chain, which get extraordinarily complicated, um, all of those have been not only without, outside of our control, but as is typical, they're, they're outside of our visibility. So when we circle back toward the end of this and talk about you know, what could we do differently, what may we think about as we progress into the future, um, not knowing what the future holds, visibility into the supply chain is a huge part of, of this. There, there may be cases when we as governments, especially big muscular governments, have the ability to, to manage or influence some of the, the tiers beneath the prime contractor when it comes to, to what, what they can do. So, so it is a complex issue. But going to the, and those are all components of the problem, sort of as, as I describe here. It, obviously, solving this problem isn't, isn't going to be simple. It's not going to be easy. It's definitely not going to be accomplished in the near term. We're not going to one day declare that, hey, the problem's over. Um, I, none of us know when, when we can ever, if ever, say that. Um, but what we can say is that we have a responsibility as professionals in our, in our business of public acquisition and procurement. And I know we have both suppliers and practitioners, procurement, you know, buyers and sellers, both on this webinar, and for which I'm very thankful because I think the dialogue is what's going to be so important. Um, I, I think the immediate after action, even now, I think we're all developing uh, lessons learned. Once we have the opportunity to say, hey, the dust has settled a little bit, let's start documenting these things. I, I want to make sure that we recognize on the government side, on the buying side, that we cannot sit in a closed room with a bunch of other procurement professionals and start articulating or drawing up solutions. Um, I think that is going to take dialogue, coordination, um, and, a, and a whole lot of trust between the buyers and the sellers. And that, to me, that's going to be a, a major theme that comes out of the way we've had to react, all of us. To, to the issues um, that we have faced. The, the, one of the bigger problems in this COVID-19 um, recovery and reaction, the phase we're in right now still, is we have no discernible timeline. We do not know, unlike, you know, Hal mentioned earlier, volcanoes, uh, you know, and, and, and earthquakes, things that are prone, natural disasters that, that, that are prone to certain areas of our, of our big and giant geography. Um, hurricanes for many of us, tornadoes for many of us in the Midwest, especially, all, all of those things are, we, are emergencies that we can anticipate to the extent we know they're going to happen. We just do not know the time or place. But within our contingency planning as procurement folks, we, we can sort of anticipate those. And what's, what's good about those is they are finite. You, you know that a hurricane the, from, the, from our first preparation for it to hit land or to hit our jurisdiction is seven or eight days later, we're gonna be in the recovery phase and it's that finite. Tornadoes, even much less, or, you know, so all of those things, are, they happen often enough where we at least have some kind of a timeline. The extraordinary thing about what we're reacting to right now is there's absolutely no timeline that any of us can discern um, and really hang our hats on. So therein lies the overarching problem. All the other problems I think that we are facing on a tactical level, all fit under the, the strategic issue of we've got a crisis, we have to act urgently, and we have no idea when we're not going to be in this mode, not really. So I think that's, that, those are the points I think I wanted to, to make here. And, and the idea being, hopefully, that if we're not thinking about it now, that we, will, we won't fail to start documenting what we wish we had done, what we wish we had known, so that we can try to anticipate to the extent that we can how we could better react when the next emergency occurs, whether it's one of these short-term, fairly common natural disasters or mega events like the Super Bowl, all of these things that, are, that end up being emergency procurement issues, um, or whether it's some very long-term, ill-defined, uh, ultra-complicated matter like the COVID-19 pandemic. And with that, I will ask that we go to the next slide. Okay, before, before we do that, David, let me uh, ask uh, Hal or, or Norma if you have anything to um, 
to add to what all those good things that David just said. Well, I, I can relate to exactly. Uh, I, I, I agree with everything that David said is what we're looking at is unique. I think the one thing that stands out in my mind that might be a solution, we all, I'm sure everybody in this call knows the value of cooperative procurement. We've all experienced the value of leveraging other people's clout, the volume pricing and so forth we get. I think maybe one of the things that we might look at at this is something that's been somewhat successful, although it was, was brought in late and kind of a limited in most cases. But, and that is the idea that in the United States, the virus kind of appeared in waves and we all know what happened in New York City and then, and even now, we have parts of the country, like in the middle of the country, that are just experiencing it. So it, there's kind of a wave effect. And so maybe we need to look in public procurement as developing some kind of a system where when the something like New York is affected, we marshal every resource that we can spare uh, and direct it toward helping them. And then the reciprocal part will be that after it passes them over and then the, the, it levels out, that then they will reciprocate and share the ventilators or those sorts of things uh, with, with those that uh, helped them in the beginning. I think that's one of the things that we might consider. And that's, that's kind of a unique thing for us, I think, in terms of that kind of, we all have mutual aid among our fire department, police department, that sort of thing. Maybe we need some sort of mutual aid agreement within procurement. Right. You know, we've always been pretty good at helping one another, but you're talking about something, Al, as I hear you talking, something that's perhaps a little more formal than we do it right now. Because, you know, you think about things that, for example, happened on 9-11. We all rushed to the, uh, you know, the Port Authority's aid. But you're, I, I hear you saying something that needs to be a little bit more formal. Am I correct? I think we need to explore that. I think it has a possibility because we've been so at a loss for answers that to me it offers some promise if we can do it. And I realize there's a lot of logistical problems with it. It's not just that easy. And you know, there, there's a lot of fear if I give my stuff away, will I need it tomorrow? Or if I loan them my stuff or will they reciprocate? There's a lot of, there's a lot of issues there, but I think it's worth pursuing. Yeah. You know, and another thing you said, you talked about cooperative procurement. And as all of us who have taken, you know, any courses at all from NIGP or anybody else, you know, we know there are two types of cooperative procurement. One is where we write a uh, third party, uh, third parties agreement. And the other is where we engage in uh, what we often refer to as true cooperative procurement, where you actually, as you said a moment ago, consolidate uh, the procurement power in order to, to leverage whatever it is you need to leverage. Now, we, uh, we often think about, and historically, I thought about leveraging for purposes of price, but here we're talking about leveraging what? For both purposes of continuity of supply and uh, availability of supply. So, do I hear you saying that there's more of a, we should be looking more also at true cooperative procurement, that's not, before you answer the question, that's not to say that our cooperative procurement groups have not done a great job because they have, they have served our community well. But what do you think about, is there more potential for true cooperative procurement? I, I think that it's an excellent uh, idea to launch it off of existing cooperative procurement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And so, it just expands it into some other additional dimensions. Yeah, yeah. Because they, well, that's right. Well, uh, who else has not chimed in here? Uh, Norma, did you, you want to chime in on this slide at all? Yes. Um, and one of the things that I've heard from everybody that has talked about it already is that we can't be sitting in our own cubicle or in our own office to be able to do this. We've got to interact with a lot of different people, which is going to really um, lead us up to our, our next slide um, that uh, for you, Steve. But okay. There are lots of people involved in the process. Absolutely. Well, let's 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 get going there, and uh, you'll see. Uh, you know, we've talked about who needs to be involved in this whole process, and you'll see there this term down at the bottom where I refer to a state and local procurement network. And frankly, I'm not really sure it would be accurate to say that 
that there is a state and local procurement network in the formal sense that we envision, you know, where it's literally working together to, uh, to achieve strategic goals. But I think the parts are there. And as all three of you have said, and, and I'm sure as everybody here in the audience knows, uh, the potential, if we can get these disparate categories of groups and individuals involved working together uh, on the front end rather than on, uh, on the front end, uh, it could really uh, be, uh, be powerful. Now, one of the great things we've seen uh, as we've chased the problem is that there has been, uh, there's been tremendous cooperation, but, but I'm thinking how nice it would be as we planned contracts that are ready to go in advance of, uh, in advance of widespread emergencies, how nice it would be if we could have a, um, have a fully functioning network, you know, and, and by the way, it could be at a high level, you could have different breakouts for specific categories of good services. You could focus on issues or whatever. But, uh, and Norma, you're gonna talk uh, a little bit in the next slide about uh, how this, uh, this concept is, uh, has taken reality. Before, Norma, before you start, let me chime in long enough to just acknowledge um, a lot of what's going on in the chat box. I wanna make sure folks realize we we are watching that, and we. I, I want to thank Brenda for the link you sent to all uh, all attendees on anti fraud. I want to mention to Magda that I have we have seen your um, initial question, which we will answer at some point, probably after this. Fairly complicated about the the life of a distributor in all of this, um, but I just want to acknowledge that we are able to to see what you're writing. We want to encourage you to keep doing that. This the dialogue, even though we have so many folks on the call, we aren't really able to have kind of the traditional webinar or, or dialogue that we would have if we were all in a room together. But I want you to know that you're, the, the things you're putting in the chat box are being captured and we're paying attention to those. So thank you for, for engaging. All right, Norma, sorry about that. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, this slide also goes to the heart of what we're talking about, I think, and it's procurement with a purpose. And the phrase comes from Europe, from uh, Thomas Udezen, and he actually is the CPO for uh, life science company Bayer. And they have companies in, in 70 different countries. So he has had a lot of influence in Europe in, in developing this procurement with a purpose. And the procurement with a purpose really is a sustainable procurement pledge. And that's where every entity that's working on this procurement is its procurement with a purpose and everybody has agreed to a common purpose or a goal. Um, the, their mutual uh, trustworthiness has to be demonstrated um, where you're trusting your you, the people that are working on this procurement with you. And this could be individuals from very high up in the governmental uh, arena to, uh, to those individuals that are in the trenches actually doing the work. And that's where I think that we need to make sure that we're on the forefront is that we are in that group of individuals that are making those decisions before it gets pushed down to procurement. Procurement, if they're uh, more elevated to the top of the discussion, link, which I noticed that there was a comment uh, in regards to this, if we're at the top of the chain where we are in that group that is a sustainable procurement um, group, then we're going to be able to affect more change than we would if we were just pushed everything down, which seems to be what's going on now in most instances. So um, I think that we have to look at all the parties that need to be involved in that, who they are, who the players are, and what purpose they're going to be giving to the situation, and the good faith cooperation and collaboration. Um, and that means it's with, with all members. And that goes from the manufacturer to the suppliers, uh, the distributors, the the raw fabrics that go into the products. It goes from the very beginning of the process all the way through getting those supplies to who they need to go to. So that is the whole sustainable procurement is a sustainable procurement supply 
uh, and that's what we need to work on. So we need to be at the top of the scale instead of the bottom. But right. um, with that, I'm going to ask um, Steve, is there anything that you want to add? Well, you know, I found this article interesting, Norma, just as you did. And, um, and I, you know, we recognize that right now, uh, each of the, let me flip back to that slide. You know, each of these, each of these groups, you know, obviously enters into this network with what their own set of, uh, uh, values and individual goals. But, uh, but if they're going to come together, you, this is what I found so interesting about the article is you've got to develop these things that you have in the, these blue bars here, you know, based on, um, you know, based on what you mentioned a minute ago, you actually have to have a sharing of a commitment to work together. You know, in this case, you know, it's obviously a sharing of a commitment uh, to, uh, it could be at any level, frankly, but in this case, the one we're talking about this seminar is to how do we uh, keep the supplies coming to us and not get gouged on the price, on the pricing when it does. So, uh, and look at all these things that we ought to talk about in so many seminars, you know, relationships, uh, good faith cooperation, which you touched on, collaboration, you know, and I believe in, uh, in, uh, in this article, Norma, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't, didn't Utterson talk about how actually competitors were actually, were, had dropped the walls basically, and were working with one another. I think I recall that, is that right? Yes, and, and actually that was, and, and one of the things he said, it helps to build collaboration and building relationships is, is in the solution. So the biggest thing is relationship building with all of these people with a common purpose. And that common purpose is to get those needed goods or supplied to, supplies to the, the individuals that need them, you know, like those frontline providers of service that we've seen in this pandemic. So yeah, the main thing is collaboration and relationship building, but you need to have it at the highest level possible and then and have that go through the entire organization. Right. Yeah. I also found his comment in, in that article about uh, how how important passion was, you know, and for those of us who think this is going to be a uh, X-rated presentation, it's not. It's not that kind of passion, but the uh, uh, you know, and, he, and I think he particularly talked about, as I recall, the passion of the younger people who did, had really taken up this cause. And I think uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's so encouraging. Norma, thanks for sharing that article. That's a great article. Well, Charles, and uh, it looks like we're at the time for questions. And, you know, and I, on my screen, since I'm sharing, I can't see any of these questions or comments. Could you, uh, would you be, uh, would you please read us some questions? We'll try to address two or three. Sure. Hey, and one of the questions we got was, um, will we get a copy of the slides? Yes, we will be sending out uh, a recording and the slides tomorrow to everybody that registered. So I've got that question out of the way. Let's look at this. Let's start at the top now. Um, uh, how do you prevent price gouging? That's one of the questions we got. Okay. Uh, uh, I've been talking a lot. Uh, David, you want to talk, do you want to speak to that? Sure. How'd I just throw you that tough question? You were, you know, hi, hi. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, well, I'll, I mean, I'll attempt to address it. There, this is a very difficult one. This is a thorny issue. It's, you know, when when we we know that whenever our process, which is built for deliberative action, it's not the process of procurement in in the public sector. And I know this is a pain point, probably for those <laughs> those of us that are in it on the government side and, and those of us that are selling into it from the industry side, um, we, we frequently have to explain that the process that we are responsible for, our public service, is, is a process that's, that's built not for speed, but it's built to make the wisest decision. So the, the, the public procurement process is a process of, hopefully, of wisdom rather than speed. And, and what we do every day when we come to work, and I have for all these many years, and I know that Hal and Steve and Norma all have as well, is try to find the right balance between getting people what they need as quickly as is reasonably possible, while at the same time ensuring that we're not overspending public money or misspending public money or belying the public trust. Um, so that balance, it's easier to do when, when we don't have a crisis going on. When 
we face the circumstances that we've been facing since really at least in DC since the middle of March. Um, we have very, we suddenly lose what little control we had over the seller side of, of the world. Not only do we not know the sellers that are approaching us, somebody made the great point in either one of the questions or a chat um, comment a little while ago that, yeah, we have, you, get, you have people that have um, in 95 masks and they have, you know, PPE gowns and face shields. They, they're coming out of the woodwork. These are people we've never heard of before, but that doesn't mean they don't have it. Um, so if, if they do have it and if they can prove to you they have it, and we, we have used, believe it or not, we're using FaceTime in the DC government to just, when a vendor reaches out to us out of the blue that we've never vetted, we've never dealt with before, and they say, yeah, I've got pallet, this pallets full of this stuff. We say, well, why don't you just go ahead and FaceTime me and we'll, you know, I, I need to hear you talk, I need to see you talking and look at those pallets of stuff you have. You might be surprised, maybe you wouldn't be, about how many of them don't have pallets of anything. So not only do we have vendors that we've never dealt with before, but if we, if we do find out that they've got what we need, and, I, and again, the need is urgent and the need is related to life and death, then, then you get to the pricing equation. And many of us, for various, depending upon what the, you know, the structure of your financing situation is, um, we suddenly have to make the determination, are we willing to pay what we know to be three times what this would cost any other time? Are we willing to pay that? And the answer is yes or no, depending upon all the circumstances that, that surround you and your individual jurisdiction and your elected officials. And it's a tough question because I'm, I'm afraid, unlike the normal circumstance where when, in a buy-sell equation, I think most of us have experienced this enough to know that generally the seller knows more than the buyer does about what it costs to manufacture and deliver a, a good or a service, but in, in particular, a good, a commodity. The, the, the seller knows what it took to get that in your hands. They know what the price is. They know what their margin is. Yeah. And we just have to, based on the competitive process, we kind of go with that price. Okay. Now, in, in, go ahead. I think somebody, Steve, was that you that was? Yes. I, and I, what, what, what I thought I'd do, this is such a great question, and it really speaks to the heart of what we're going to cover later. And if it's okay with the other three guys, let's just go ahead and talk about, you know, what we're going to recommend later. Because, you know, David, you're addressing so well, you know, what we're having to do right now. But yeah. what we're going to be talking about later on the presentation, I'll just go and lay out now in response to the question, is that, you know, beginning with, we're talking about having contracts in place that will both provide for pricing under normal times, if we can use that term, but also we'll have a uh, have a have the uh, the uh, propo respondents to RAPs will actually provide you a methodology by which you will they would uh, adjust their pricing uh, in, in abnormal times in unusual times. So you know, that's just a little preview of things to come because right now david as you're describing right now you know, it's very risky it's uh you know we we could literally be hit, hit left high and dry but as we're going to propose later we're talking about having uh you know contracts in place that will actually be there well in advance before any emergency arises and uh uh you know and actually we would have had a chance while we were evaluating the proposals again pre emergency to actually evaluate with the right people through the right process, et cetera, uh, process, et cetera, how that contractor, if we select them, will actually price their goods or services during times of emergency. So, but we'll talk more about that later. Uh, Norma, uh, how you guys want to weigh in on that? No, I think David covered pretty much and you. Okay, good. All right. Well, let's yeah, keep... I agree. Okay. All right. All righty. David, you're on again. Well, here we go. Just as I was saying, um, <laughs> you know, toward the end of this slide, I, I probably should have just moved the question slide ahead to this one because this is sort of what I was <laughs> just talking to, including price gouging, which you, you see is on this slide. Um, I don't know that I have a whole lot more to say. I, I, I don't want to um, take away from the, the comments that others might have on this one. The, the one thing that I probably haven't covered very well that are, that's in my kind of talking notes on this slide 
is that third bullet about master agreements and contracts that ran dry. You know, obviously there was no, um, we, there was just, it was inconceivable that supplies, including contingency supplies, yeah. you know, buffers in the, in the supply chain would evaporate, but they have because the duration of the event has been e so elongated and so unpredictable. And, and, and when supplies run dry, what, what you see is um, what, what I would call, and I, I, I think we've all seen it, is kind of survivor behavior. We've all had to f both probably in the supply chain itself and certainly at the delivery point, which is in the government, um, we've all had to, we've all sort of engaged in survival behavior. It is um, the circumstance under great stress where we begin clamoring for supplies and we been begin clamoring for everything we can get to serve the people that we know are in, in the most precarious of positions, the, the, the patients that have been infected and hospitalized um, during this pandemic. Okay. So that, that kind of is a pretty compelling point about this and everything else seems to, and I don't know that there's a great way to mitigate it other than to be conversant about it with our suppliers um, in, in, during peacetime, basically, during the time when we're not in reaction mode, we're not in survival mode, um, and begin to have honest, heart to heart talks about, you know, when and if this happens, how are we going to work together? How yeah. are we going to work together? Yeah. And, and, and as it says in the first bullet of your next slide here, you actually have contracts in place that will, uh, that will actually enable the needs to be met before the needs arise. So having stolen your first bullet, I'll let you continue. <laughs> well, I, on, on this one, on, now on this slide, the assuring continuity slide, the, the, the top bullet is just kind of classic contingency contracting. I think all of us probably do that, where, where we say, you know, when, when we need potable water, you know, in the circumstances of a natural disaster, that is a very common and compelling need. Um, we know in advance where we're going to get that. We know who we're going to get it from. We know what they're going to charge us during that time because we put in place contracts that are contingency contracts about that event that's un inevitable, but, but the time and place are not known. So, and that's kind of a classic definition of what contingency contracting is. What, but in, 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 the, in this case, we, we need to really hone that. This is, a, this is a part of the art of procurement. This is not the science of you know, low responsive and responsible offer. This is not that part of procurement. This is the part where you're really deep into the relationship in advance um, of, of the contingency itself occurring. So those are, I, I think when we concentrate on, we're really good at what we do. I, I think we're very good. And all my years working with the professionals that do this work, I've been um, forever impressed by their sense of service to others, their sense of the public good, their, their high level of ethical behavior, everything about them I love, everything about our profession I love. Um, but it's time to, and we do that really well, it's time now to get really good at these, at the gray stuff, this really unknown area of what do you do when all hell breaks loose? What do you do when something you never predicted happens? And, and, and that's really the essence of this slide. Um, I think that we, we talk about cooperative procurement groups, which have been talked about already on this, the, the consolidation of contracts that somebody, I think Hal mentioned very, very correctly earlier about sort of like the, the, the regional effect of some of this pandemic spread, you know, there have been these hot spots and then they've sort of waned and then there have been other ones. And so, you know, the, it's kind of a rolling need. That, that, is, that has been the case in this pandemic. We've never planned for that. I, I certainly don't recall us ever nationally, like at the 50 state procurement director level, which is NASPO, by the way, the organization that brings together the 50 state procurement directors. We've never talked, I don't think, about how do you manage a, a rolling, a geographically rolling um, issue where an emergency just sweeps from one side of the country across. But yet we, we need to think about that. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to open it now really for Norma, Hal, and, and Steve to add their thoughts to this slide. All right, Norma, let's go in order, Norma. Okay. One of the things that I think that this is teaching us that is that we need to do a better job of risk management review for contracts that we're putting in place to, you know, is this contract something that is critical to the mission? Is it criti critical to health and welfare? Is it critical to operation, whatever it is, 
we need to do a better job in procurement of asking those questions of our customers internally is what risk would have what risks would we face if we could not get these products for you what would it what what occurrence would happen and when we do that and we understand the risks a little bit better then we can then we can put more emphasis on those items that we need to make sure are taken care of through the solicitation document and um, making sure that just like David said here, making sure that all of these items are, are covered uh, is, is part of that. So I think that risk management is something that we all have to look at a little bit better. Yeah. Now, I, think, I think one of the things that we need to look at that we've probably not paid as much attention to in the past, and that is that this, first and second tier providers in our supply chain are of interest to us. And when we award a contract, we need to look at them. And you think back uh, in 2008 when the big earthquake happened in uh, Japan and it brought down Toyota, not because of their immediate factories being uh, affected, but by their supply chain at the first and second tier uh, and it actually knocked them off from being the top automotive company in the world to for a while in second place. So there's lessons out there from the private sector uh, that we can look at. One of the things that the private sector is doing right now is they're cr creating digital twins of their organization. And they're basically creating a whole bunch of what ifs using technology, digital technology and saying, okay, let's play this out what if this happened? What if this happened? What would we do? And, you know, they're, they're disaster games, but they're worthwhile looking at in terms of, okay, let's think this out. Just, we've mentioned collectively a number of times, none of us ever really thought that some of these things could or would happen, but it's the new reality. So I, I think that some of those things that, that, uh, the private sector has done, and, and they're based on technology, a lot of them, uh, and looking deeper into the supply chain and creating the what ifs is, is of value to us in terms of maybe we got more limited resources, but we, at least with the resources we have, we should look at it. You know, Hal, that's a real good point. You know, I know one of the things that uh, we were doing in Nashville years ago, uh, and I'm sure almost everybody here on this on this uh, webinar is doing right now, is that when we are evaluating any uh, uh, you know potential contract uh, contractor through an RAP process, is that we would ask uh, we would we would we would we would seek out rather uh, we'd look at the you know the first second tier suppliers and we would ask the uh, the the potential contractors to tell us uh, to, to what extent have you as you know you all i should say as a team work together and with what success and uh you know that's not the total solution but that's certainly something we would have to do in this new type of contract that we're putting together and and on the consolidation point uh, uh in addition to having all sorts of new resources popping up that will help us evaluate proposals better uh if we truly consolidate and uh, uh, pull together our contracts where we have, you know, just a smaller number of agreements that we're all writing, uh, just think of the ability we're going to have for people to create specialization of tasks. I don't think it's going to get rid of any staff in any local government or state agency because they're already stretched already, but we're going to have the ability, I think, to, uh, to acquire a deeper capabilities in subject matter expertise and also in uh, information gathering, information analysis and the like. Okay. All right, uh, let's move on to the, um, to the next slide, Norman, I believe that's yours. Norman, you need to unmute. Norma, don't touch the mute button ever again. <laughs> I'm so sorry, y'all. I'm sitting here just talking away. Sorry about that, y'all. Um, that's that's my worst mistake. I'll leave it. I'll leave my mic on from now on. 
Um, but Project Airbridge was a project that the federal government t took on. And one of the things that the federal government um, decided or learned was that they had no idea about who had product, who, who uh, the manufacturers of the product were, what were the materials, um, how, you know, where the, how much each one of those manufacturers had on hand at any one point, who they were selling to, uh, you know, who was receiving the supplies or whatever. So what they did was they took a tool from a supply chain tool from the de uh, defense department in their cloud environment and they got the records of six major medical distributors into that cloud where they could manipulate the data, uh, similar to what um, Hal was talking about. And they could find out um, every supply chain that had, you know, of the six major medical manufacturers of what products they had on hand, where they were expected to be delivered, um, you know, how many were gonna be delivered to each location, prices that, was, that were being um, paid for the supplies. So they gathered a lot of data. Uh, and the reason that they put this project together was because they felt there was a need to transport and distribute needed PPE to COVID hotspots. And I've, I, I have seen lots of comments or several comments on here about um, you know, orders being confiscated. I will tell you that uh, there, th uh, there was one individual that I heard of that actually sent the um, um, the, the National Guard to protect the, their orders as they were coming in so that they wouldn't get confiscated. But um, with that being said, you know, we really have to take a look at, okay, is that one of the things that I have to look at in this type of an emergency? Is there a threat of having these orders confiscated? But um, one of the things that I, I found very interesting is what th this program did after taking this uh, supply chain tool and then dumping the data into the supply chain tool with all of what they did in regards to the, the supplies and materials that were going out to these hot spots. The program cost $91 million for the program. So my thought on that is couldn't that have been done with much less money so that more money could have gone towards getting those supplies um, than it did to develop the program and get the results from the program. But they did want to try and manage the critical shortage of PPE and other medical supplies by accelerating international delivery. So that was one of the things that they were looking at was how much of the product that our, our manufacturers and companies here in um, the United States was going overseas. So that was one of the things that they were trying to do was make sure that we were taking care of here before um, you know, those supplies going overseas. Okay, no, Norma, thank you. And in the interest of time, I think we're just gonna keep drilling here because we're getting close to a question point. But right now, according to my clock, we have 27 minutes left because we do wanna respect the, uh, the time of the attendees. This next slide gets into the um, heart of what we were talking about, David and Norman, and how we're talking about earlier, about building these contracts that have not only uh, provide for supply and pricing during normal times, but also supply and pricing during abnormal times. And uh, quickly, you know, this this the strategy that we that we have uh, been talking about is that you use a uh, performance based or open ended type RFP that does these three things that uh, you see on the slide and um, of course you would uh, include certain things in the uh, the RFP as you can see there but the heart of the slide here is, is this last um, last bullet point with the three arrowheads underneath him underneath it you would require uh, respondents to RFPs to provide their pricing for normal times. Uh, secondly, how their master agreement would assure continuity of supply, continuity of supply, their plan B as we call it, and the pricing methodology they would use while assuring continuity of supply. So again, during normal times, as David referred to it a moment ago, you would actually be putting in place a contract that not only provides for routine normal times, but also for these uh, widespread emergencies when they pop up. So uh, this is a, to me at least, is uh, one of the more critical slides we put together. Anybody have any comments on that quickly? 
No, I'm fine. Okay, good. Because I think we. All righty. Our next slide is um, is also mine, and it's uh, again we're asking we're essentially with this type of RFP that we've discussed, you're essentially allowing suppliers to tell you how in the event, uh, you know, that you're faced with a widespread emergency, it's right on top of it, and you have these contracts that provide for contingencies in place. These are just some of the things that we saw through our research that uh, were done on the back end in the current pandemic, but that could be done, you know, on the front end and when people are proposing on our contracts. Okay, Norma. All right. So um, when it, the main thing that you need to look at when you're developing these contracts, and I know, um, you know, the, 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 here the pandemic has hit, the emergency is here. How do I, how do I work at that now? Um, and, you know, with getting contracts in place, and that's really what you need to look at is what type of a solicitation you're going to be issuing for that. Everybody knows that in RFPs, you can negotiate, you can um, have question and answer period, you can have a best and final, there are a lot of different things that you can have, but it takes time to get those contracts in place. So right now is the time where we need to be building contracts or putting contracts into place that is going to resolve this issue, hopefully for future emergencies. So one of the things that you need to make sure of is that you have the enabling authority. And right now during this uh, uh, emergency time to put together a contract that you may want to be using immediately right now, which everyone would want to do, is just making sure that your laws, codes, regulations, or ordinances allow you to do that. If they don't, then it's time, again, like I said earlier, for um, the law, pe people to start looking at their laws, legislation, ordinances, and see how you need to um, encourage government to change those so that you can do what you need to do in time of an emergency. One of the things that I found uh, dealing with FEMA and their regulations, uh, they have very strict regulations for reimbursement, but know who your FEMA contact person is for your agency. Don't be afraid to call them. Call them and talk to them until you feel like they're sick of hearing from you. But call and ask if a certain type of solicitation could be done. Call and explain how you want to do it. Call and uh, you know tell the, tell you know discuss with them the pros and cons of different things. And you may be surprised uh, that they will say yes. Go ahead with that type of solicitation. FEMA, the main thing that they're looking for is that there is some type of competition. And as long as you can explain how the competition is going to come in the solicitation, they're pretty um, easy to work with in regards of getting an approval for that. You know, the, one thing that I said was the time frame needed to establish the contract. We need to be working fast in the time of emergency. The time frame for putting that contract in place is going to be shortened to, to a great deal. Um, and then who's going to help draft the specifications of the scope of work? We need to go to the frontline workers. We need to find out exactly what it is that they need, how quickly they need it, and all of their requirements. How your entity or agency will evaluate the alternatives offered. They need to send in samples. There are a lot of things that you can request for them to do is send in a sample of what you're going to be supplying. Um, give us the link to the manufacturer um, so that we can contact the manufacturer directly. Let us know who your second tier supplier would be. So there's a lot of things that you can put in the RFP. Um, make sure that you, you know, that you know exactly what questions you want to ask in that RFP. Uh, best value bid solicitation is uh, one of the types of solicitations that, that we can enter into here in South Carolina. And that is where it's, it's, it's a hybrid of a bid and a, um, an RFP where 60% of the weighting factor is gonna be on price, but the other 40% are gonna be on all of those other things that you're asking the supplier to give you, like their pricing methodology, uh, who their suppliers are, give you evidence that their supplier has um, been able to supply their requirements, um, the, 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 the manufacturer's requirements and getting those items to them. So a lot of different things that you can handle there. And I'm gonna open it for uh, other, other comments from the group. 
David, how you guys have anything? No, I think I think you covered it very well, Norma. I do too. So, and um, so we're down to our. I know this took a while to get here, but we're now time to a, for another respond to your answers time. So, um, Charles, could you help us out there? Sure. I've got one of the questions. Uh, let's go back up to the top here. It says, um, yeah, so are most government agencies following their standard procurement sourcing and quality control of PPE or using new and creative ways of sourcing and testing of new vendors? That's really more of a polling question, I guess we, uh, we should, uh, we should probably get out and ask, you know, but uh, um, is it possible, Charles, for not GP to do some kind of pulse poll unless we can work it in here real quick? Um, yeah, I'm not sure we can create one on the fly here. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, but, but that's a great question. And uh, let's go to another question, please. Oh, by the way, I, Steve, this is Dave Gregg, and I want to, one of the questions, and Charles, I apologize if I jumped ahead of you on this one. The very last question that's in the question box right now is on force majeure. This, and I think this is one we all probably will have something to say about. So I, I, I think that's a great question. The question that Chris asks is how important is force majeure in a contract in regards to our current situation, a pandemic? Well, it, I, I'll start, but I, I'd love to hear the thoughts of, of the other experts on, on the phone here, um, and including folks that may want to add in the chat box. It, it becomes extremely important, right? We all have force majeure written into a, a contract. Mm -hmm. It's a standard contract provision. It, and, but even then, it contemplates um, uh, um, an act that, that we don't know when or where it's going to happen, but it could happen. So, you know, so that's what force majeure addresses. The, the problem with force majeure in this case is that the, it, there, there's no control over how we remediate the problem. So even though force majeure is in effect, in almost every single government contract that I'm familiar with, when, when you, it's a negotiable matter after the fact here because no one anticipated that they wouldn't be, that there was no resiliency in the supply chain, that our prime vendors would not be able to, to manage that slack that's in the supply chain because it didn't exist. It all evaporated, it all went away. So this, this then becomes a matter of renegotiation on pricing, delivery, all of the things that might have existed, notwithstanding the fact that we, you know, that we we have this provision for these these unpredictable acts, these unpredictable matters. Okay. That okay. And David, I guess again, you're talking about the contracts we have in place right now, because um, you know this concept that the four of us are floating here, we're talking about through a writing our RIPs a certain way, evaluating the proposal a certain way, of course requiring certain types of information, including how the supplier would sustain continuity of supply, hopefully force majeure would not kick in. That's not to say that this methodology we've considered is perfect, but uh, hopefully we would get, uh, what's, what am I trying to say here? There would be less need for this, you know, the force majeure to arise, okay? Um, Norma, Harold? I think that's sufficient answers. Okay, let's move on, Charles. Yeah. Another question. Okay. Um, um, how do you deal with federal rated orders? All this is fine, but if the feds uh, rate orders, doesn't that priority trump all these plans? If they what orders? I didn't hear. I didn't understand that verb there. If they do what with orders? They said, um, "How do you deal with federal rated orders? All this is fine, but if the Fed's rate orders doesn't that priority trump all these plans?" Norma, why don't you speak to that? Because I think you spoke about that a moment ago. So, um, yes. Well, one of the things that you can do is, um, and this is a was going to come on another slide, but it was going to be about uh, preferred customer status. You know, preferred customer status, really, you have you don't hear too much about that in government because um, the federal government likes to be the preferred customer, um, and that is uh, who has 
come and raided some of those orders that have been coming in. But, um, you know, you have to have a con contingency plan. In, fa in, fa in fact, what you can do is have multiple awards <clears throat> on a contract instead of just having one. You can have multiple awards. Uh, we have a fixed price bid type contract where you're fixing the initial price and say, if, if, any, if any and everyone that can supply this item to me, this is the maximum we're going to pay. However, we will honor prices lower than this. And if your price is lower, you may be the preferred vendor. Um, for, you know, because of the lower price. So there are a lot of different things that you can build into your contract, but try not to have just one source of supply for a certain item. Uh, build in multiple award contracts uh, in, in with your different types of uh, contracts that you're awarding. Okay, Norma, that's, that's an excellent answer. In the interest of time, why don't we move on to your next slide because you're already, we're, we're talking about it, so. Okay. All right, and this slide is the uh, is uh, in regards to supply chain management stabilization, <clears throat> and it is the type of solicitation that you put in place. Um, best value. I just talked about the best value um, re uh, request for proposal or a, a, a normal type request for proposal or different. Um, you know, they have um, the performance based. Uh, request for proposals or solutions-based re request for proposal. It's all in what you put in the document. You need to make sure that the prime supplier is committed to delivery time and that's, you know, they tell you how they're going to be committed to that delivery time. Uh, and when you call it a prime supplier, that means that, okay, under normal circumstances, you're going to be the supplier that I'm going to come to. But if you can't fulfill my needs, this is what we're going to do uh, we're going to go to the next supplier and um, get our needs from them. So that's where the multiple awards in the contract comes into play, uh, making sure that you can do that, number one, like I said previously. And if not, get your ordinance or laws rewritten so that you can make multiple awards on a con contract. Because having one source for all of your needs is not a wise thing. Um, so make sure that the contracting officer um, knows what, you know, the uh, prime supplier and sub suppliers, ask them to provide you that information in the solicitation. Who is it? How are you going to guarantee to me that um, you can fulfill my needs in a normal time and in an emergency time, knowing that in an emergency, we will be paying more, but what is that price right now today? What could you guarantee us in time of emergency of the price that we would pay? And then again, as the preferred customer status that I just talked about. Okay, all right. David? Okay, the, I think we've probably touched upon almost everything here that might be barriers to success, but this slide I think gives me the opportunity to just hit upon a couple sort of high level points that I think have, have come up recurringly throughout our talk this afternoon. We, I, I think across the board, regardless of whether you're in state and local government, whether you're in the supplier chair, whether you're in the services world um, of you know, being on site in, in government, whether you're in consulting or IT systems integration, um, or whether you're others that are involved in government procurement, meaning elected officials, auditors, um, citizens, everyone who has any interest in the process. W one overarching barrier to success, in my opinion, is insulation. If we decide that we can do this alone, if we decide that our state is more important than the state next door, or our city is more important than the county, or if, if we are insulated and believe that we're a great, we're, we're the best customer this vendor has, we probably have another thing coming. So insulation is a, is a barrier to success across all of these jurisdictions. So cooperation, communication, all of the things that prevent us from being insulated become extremely important at a time like this. And I, I'm a very strong proponent of procurement in government, never having an us them mentality, never thinking that the buyer is more important than the seller. In other words, that the government is more important than the than the vendor that we're dealing with. 
we are a team. We, we, obviously, when we form a contract, we, we become a team, even though we often don't seem to behave that way. But as we think about contingency planning, as we think about how we're going to react in the future, I, I think that the cooperative belief that no one comes out better than anyone else in a contract, a good contract, the best contracts are ones in which both the buyer and the seller walk away having achieved what they wanted to or needed to achieve. And, and so we must abandon, and I think we have over the years, gotten better and better at recognizing that all successful contracts are ones in which the buyer and seller are equally fulfilled. So we, we need to let that kind of thinking pervade our planning for future contracting. And it's a pretty, to me, a very important point. And I would offer um, a few minutes for others that may want to comment on that. I think you're spot on, David. I think, um, you know, as we as we said at the very beginning, uh, being in a position in the future to uh, keep the, you know, the supplies flowing is definitely going to require, you know, good relationships. Norma talked about that on her slide at the beginning and uh, trust and a lot of other elements, which I won't go over again. Somebody mentioned earlier and I'll, and I'll comment on it now because it's an extraordinarily important point. It was in the chat box, but I, they, they, they mentioned, and I think I might've mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, that this is a unique opportunity really for us to, um, to occupy finally um, a seat within that closed room that, we've, that we're often not allowed into where the, the CIO and the governor or you know, all, all of the movers and shakers in government are in there you know, figuring out how we're gonna do things. Well, we're, we're, we're part of that team. We, we have been you know, part of that team for a long time, but we're often not invited into those initial and early discussions. Um, that we need to build upon the momentum that has developed within the procurement community um, over these past 10 or 12 weeks. I think we need to build upon um, everyone's now understanding that the procurement professionals are an extraordinarily import, important part of a government responding to a crisis. And I, I don't want us, now that we're in the room, I don't want us to lose the opportunity to maintain our presence, to be professional, to be supportive and to be um, always try to figure out the right way to get to the answer being yes. Um, so that a barrier to success, of course, is the fact that we're sometimes outside that room. Uh, we have a unique opportunity here to, to take advantage of the fact that we're in the room now. Let's not leave. Okay. All right. Anything else anyone else wants to add? Okay, but I think you're exactly right. You know, if, if there were ever a uh, crisis whose impact could have been avoided, could have been mitigated rather through the supply function, it was this one, and it would it would be also uh, future crises of this nature. All right, we come to another polling question, Charles. All right, let me find it real quick. Here it is, and it's launched. We're getting our first responses in. Probably let it go for about 45 seconds and call it. All right, we have about uh, half of the group so far that's responded. We got 10 seconds left. Five seconds left. All right, we're going to end it and share results. Norma, why don't you speak real quickly to this because we are starting to run out of time. So. Okay. <clears throat> And it's uh, how much of a con contribution, and it uh, looks like the majority is medium. You know, how could we shift that medium to major? Um, and one of the one of the reasons, uh, one of the things is, and I saw a, a polling question that was about um, how do you bring the members of the public procurement network together to start that procurement with a the process? There has to be somebody that steps up to the plate that says, "Hey, 
we can do a better job here. These are the people that need to be involved in this. Let's come up with a better solution than we have right now. So I think that being that spokesperson, being that person that steps up and says, hey, there's got to be a better way to handle this and helping to get those people together, I think you, can, you will see that that medium response is gonna to turn to a major response. And right now is a critical time for people in procurement to, to be able to sell their, their, their worth or you know, to tell how, why, in, why they're so important to the organization and should be included at the very beginning of discussions instead of later on down the road. So I think it's each one of our individual um, jobs to be the leader and step up and be even, you know, you can lead from wherever you are. You don't have to be the CPO to be the leader. You can bring these ideas and bring these things to other individuals and get them just as excited as you are about finding a better solution. So lead from where you are is what I would say. Okay. And with the hopefully the understanding of all, I'm going to skip past the next slide and allow you all to read it when you receive the copy of the slides. And because I really want to get to more questions. Uh, Charles, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's ask, answer a couple of questions if we can. Okay, I'm going to start at the top, but I mean, if you guys look to the list, there's one you want to handle because we may not really get through all of them, but uh, I'll start at the top of them. It says, uh, how do you suggest that other government bodies develop and move forward in a manner that allows these sorts of relationships to develop when the environment calls for it? Okay, can you read that again one more time, please? How do you suggest that other government bodies develop and move forward in a manner that allows these sorts of relationships to develop when the environment calls for it? Well, I th I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in on this real quickly. I think is, you know, it goes back to the keys of, first of all, having relationships with the other people you need to be involved with when such a situation arises. But, uh, and as we talked about with House Slide, having formal relationships, you know, whether it's procurement contracts, whether it's logistics of sharing or whatever, but it's preparedness in advance is the, uh, is the short answer. And that's what we've been trying to drive home in this in this in this webinar. Anybody else? Hearing none, Charles. Let's have another question. All right. Um, uh, uh, is there a centralized um, is there a centralized website developed to looking at sharing procurement resources and or piggyback on contracts? There are a lot of both. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, one of the things we've, uh, in, in fact, if you, I think you can look for resources, you can look in any number of places, including the NIGP website, the NASPA website, plus there are several excellent cooperative procurement groups, so-called cooperative procurement groups, uh, who, uh, where you can check out their, uh, their, um, their uh, master agreements that you can piggyback. But again, we're talking about moving forward you know, not only having piggybackable uh, agreements, we're also encouraging you uh, where you determine it's the right thing to do to actually set up contracts that provide for both normal times and uh, abnormal times and on a, uh, on a uh, true, con true cooperative basis. Okay, uh, we have one and a half minutes to go according to my clock. And uh, on behalf of uh, all four of us, I would like to thank you for, for joining us today. We know your time is, in, is valuable. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. But if you will look on this slide, you will see an email address. And what we will do is we, if you send that, send your question or your comment to that address, we will respond to it. That's a commitment. So uh, it'll take me a while to flip it to everybody and just to get all the answers, but, uh, uh, but we'll, we'll respond to your question. There's so much more we can do. Uh, if you're interested in us focusing on more specific areas, because literally we had to hit the tops of the mountains today, but uh, contact us there, you know, whether it's questions, comments, ideas for where we go from here and uh, we, will, we will get back to you. 
But again, on behalf of all of us, thank you and have a great day and, great day. and keep fighting the good fight. All right, I'd like to thank our panel. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this webinar. Please take time to fill out the evaluation the survey and recording and slides will be emailed to everyone tomorrow. Thanks again and have a great day. Charles, can I ask you one question before we leave? Uh, we will get a copy of all the Q&A and the comments, correct? Correct. So that we can, so we will answer those um, just as uh, David, uh, just as Steve said. So I want to make sure that if anybody did have questions or comments that weren't answered, that we will get to those. So right. thank you. Yeah. Yes. And so if anybody does have a question, you can still list it and we will get it to our panel and we'll get it answered for you. Or you can send to this email address if you think of it next week. <laughs> so, so uh, correct. Right, but Norma, thanks for bringing. No, thanks for bringing that up. All right. Thank you, buddy. Thank y'all, and we'll uh, we'll talk later. All right. Bye bye.